You may have heard of William Shatner. He was uh, the captain of Starship Enterprise in Star Trek. And he's the oldest person to have gone into space. And he went into space, probably, with the mentality of being one of the forerunners of the exploration and colonisation of space by human beings. But when he went up, he had an experience that he didn't expect. Let me read what he said about it. When I landed and came out of the spaceship, I was overwhelmed by a feeling and I started to weep. I didn't know what I was crying about. And it took me a couple of hours to be by myself to figure out what's the matter with me. And then I realised I was in grief for this beautiful world that I could see more clearly from up in space. This planet that took five billion years to evolve into what it is now. And all the multitude of things that we human beings can love and be aware of that are so beautiful. Never mind the elephants and the great predators and all that stuff, but the stuff of today. The child, your fingers. I mean, everything abounds that is a miracle and is beautiful, and we're destroying it. That was my overwhelming feeling of, oh my God, what are we doing to this tiny rock? And this came about because of an experience that he had when he was up in the spaceship. It was only there for a few minutes, and so it wasn't time to take it in. But he said that when he looked to the right, he saw this beautiful planet, blue and white, with all its continents. When he looked to the left, he saw death. Empty, dark, cold space. The theme of this talk is ecodharma. Eco, two parts to the word ecology. Ecology is the science of the interconnectedness in natural systems and the interconnectedness between living things and environment. And dharma is the teaching and the practice and the insight of interconnectedness, impermanence. Not impermanence leading only to death, but renewal, turning, changing, ever enriching. So I'd like to begin by just uh, reflecting a little bit about where we are in the world, in our, uh, in our planet, in this current situation. We run our modern world on the basis of ancient solar energy in the form of oil, coal and gas. And the Earth's crust is like a great battery. And this has allowed our civilizations to evolve and develop very, very rapidly. Since 1950 has been the biggest amount of change. And uh, sometimes this period since 1950 is called the Great Acceleration. As it happens, it uh, spans the whole of my, my own lifetime. Population of the world has moved from two and a half billion to nearly eight billion. Energy use has increased vastly in the world. We now have plastics. We used to have Bakelite. We now have plastics. Drive down the motorway and just see the plastics everywhere, scattered. Concrete, vast amounts of concrete. We build the equivalent of one Manhattan island every month in the world. And of course, the greenhouse gases that come from these processes. And there have been great improvements to human health and human lifespan. So a number of us are getting on, and we're still expecting, hoping, really, to live for a few more years. But that wasn't the normal experience. Three score years and ten was a pretty good life. Now it's a pretty normal life. And even across the whole world, life expectancy has gone up considerably in, in, in all countries. Of course, not evenly distributed completely, but very much widely distributed. But it's come as a price of pressure on Earth systems due to the waste, the pollution from fossil fuels and the pollution from chemicals, plastics, general waste and changes in land use, deforestation and so on. Interestingly, climate change that we have now was predicted in the 1970s uh, by scientists in Exxon. And they got it really accurate. They were very precisely accurate about the amount of carbon dioxide there would be in the atmosphere and the likely effects of that. And possibly the uh, politician with the greatest foresight at this time was Margaret Thatcher. She did a speech in 1989 or something like that, I think it was. Uh, she did a speech to world leaders 
and the speech was about uh, climate change it's coming, how we need to right away begin to do something about this because uh, she was effectively uh, understood the science to do with carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases and so forth. When Margaret Thatcher gave her speech, she was talking about the future. But it is now here. It's very different, isn't it? What has been the future for, uh, in, in our minds for many, many years is now the present in terms of climate change. Drought, flooding, forest fires, extreme weather events, coral bleaching, people losing their homes and livelihoods, pressure on migration. Glaciers melting, polar ice uh, becoming more fragile. Scientists have identified nine planetary boundaries. The idea of a planetary boundary is if you stay within the boundary, then you're in what is called a safe operating space, a space within which uh, you know, life is sustainable. But once you go beyond the boundary, you then enter an area of uncertainty. And in that uh, area of uncertainty, there comes a point when you might reach a tipping point. But we, nobody knows where those tipping points are. But at some point, you can get to a, a tipping point where a change becomes irreversible. Of these nine planetary boundaries, we're already, I think it's in six now, we've already crossed into the uncertainty phase. So we, of course, climate change, which I've already mentioned. The safe, uh, the, the safe operating level, they considered, was 350 parts per million for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It had been 290 for thousands of years before the Industrial Revolution, and now it's 420. The last time that it was at 420 parts per million was, uh, was 4 million years ago in the Pliocene period. And at that time, the uh, sea was 25 metres higher than it is now. And the rate at which we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere has doubled since the 1960s. And it's still at this high level, still going up at the moment. Now, this isn't necessarily a matter of doom because it's quite possible for the Earth to reabsorb the carbon dioxide, uh, as, assuming that carbon dioxide doesn't continuously be put back into the atmosphere and assuming that the Earth's systems are capable of doing the absorption, which means they need to be relatively healthy. We hear so much about biodiversity loss. The extinction rate now is about 100 times what it was before industrial times. And, of course, we also know that the abundance of wildlife has uh, reduced dramatically, uh, overall, 60% less, particularly uh, strongly for insects. Another very relevant point is, is, is world energy, how much energy we use, how much energy, effectively, we're extracting from the different sources of energy. And the amount of world energy that we use has doubled, doubled since 1980, and predicted to go on increasing. It could get as high as 45% more by 2050 without significant change to the efficiency with which we use energy. So it's on track, actually, to go up a lot more. And without, again, significant change, that could be as much as two-thirds of that could be from fossil fuels. All of this uh, uh, it, it reflects the fact that uh, we as human beings now are effectively driving the Earth's systems. So the, the period that, we've, uh, that we're now in um, is the anth Anthropocene. That means human beings are driving things. Before that, we were in a phase called the Holocene, a long, stable period of uh, climate, effectively, and, s and stable Earth systems for about 10 or 11,000 years since the last Ice Age, which allowed our civilizations to uh, develop. But we're now into the Anthropocene. What does that mean? It means that we, collectively, humanity and us, we are responsible now. The uh, essential teaching, if you like, of ecodharma is interconnectedness of us and all things. And the, the teaching is that we are not separate. And this, of course, is also the teaching, this is the teaching of ecology, and it's also the teaching of the dharma, that we are not separate. But it is the case that we now have, by uh, wishing for separateness, if you like, by uh, following uh, stories, uh, for example, a story of uh, man's dominion over the earth, for example, we've now got what we wished for. We now are responsible because we are the, the one group that are creating these conditions and therefore the one species that can do something about changing this. So because of the anthrop Anthropocene, we have it in our power to restore the health of the biosphere. And although the outlook is extremely concerning and the trends are extremely troubling. Um, catastrophe is not a given. 
it's very important to follow the science in this because there's lots of people who tell you that catastrophe is a given and it may well be the case that significant catastrophes are going to happen. But overall, survival uh, is not necessarily a th total survival of humanity and all species is not yet necessarily yet uh, uh, on the table. According to the International Panel for Climate Change, in the two most optimistic scenarios, at the point at which we stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, temperature rise will level off and then gradually slowly fall over maybe 100 years, a couple hundred years or something like that. Too late for ice. Um, there will be significant changes to the amount of ice loss, and that is now irretrievable. But uh, we're not actually on target for those better scenarios. We are actually on target at the moment for a temperature which is probably greater than 2.4 degrees centigrade by 2100. And if that is the case at 2100, then that does mean that ultimately, over the next couple of hundred years, the sea level will rise by between 6 and 10 metres. And that will become inevitable over time. And all the glaciers and much of the polar ice, therefore, will be lost. So the trends are not good, but the, uh, the opportunity and the, the responsibility is very, very clear. And that's a great thing, because there's masses and masses amounts of real-time energy. We don't need this ancient solar energy. There's real-time energy. Look at the sun outside. So listen to the wind. Think of the seas. And uh, even uh, geothermal as well. So there's thermal energy, a vast amount of thermal energy that can be tapped under the seas. I have a friend who's just um, patented the processes for offshore um, geothermal energy ex exploration. Um, if anybody's interested in the technical side, 95 pages um, of, uh, of how to do this. And uh, has now been, they've been invited by the United Nations to put forward proposals and bids and so forth. So there is all the energy that we need from real-time energy. There's no need for this battery in the Earth's crust. We can let it rest in peace. So what attitude do we need, both in terms of being uh, Dharma teachers, but also in our own lives? One of the sort of, uh, you might say, um, uh, unexpected comments that John Cook once made, I was having a conversation with him about it, and we were talking about something, although I can't remember what it was. But anyway, he said, life is a fight. Now, coming from a naturalist, you can see, you know, you only have to look around. <laughs> There's plenty of evidence for life being a fight. It's not the whole story, of course. He wasn't so uh, naive as to think that. Life is a fight. So a fighting spirit actually is quite important. And Master Sheng Yen had a different uh, approach, if you like. When Master Sheng Yen, when he came to do the second retreat at Mind Floyd, he finished the retreat with a, 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 a pretty well on the cuff, very beautiful um, statement about what has happened. And he used the metaphor of water. And his point was that if we remember where the source of water is, then we don't have a problem. We can go and get the water. But if we forget, we've got a problem. And we might have to, dr to, to drill a well, which may not be so easy in time. And then he went on to say, it's, of course, the metaphor was, this was the Dharma, the teachings. Uh, they were like the water. And he's saying, it's not that the water needs us. It's us that needs the water, just the same the Dharma. The Dharma doesn't need us. It's us that needs the Dharma. Well, so it is with the earth. We need the earth. The earth doesn't need us. Mass extinctions have happened before, and uh, life recovers. There are probably another two billion years uh, that this world will continue to be habitable. So life will continue, it will recover. But we have an opportunity to make our collective uh, life on this earth, make it sustainable by some simple but very powerful changes. Simple in concept, extremely difficult to do. So what can we contribute individually, for example? Must be wary here, of course. The fossil fuel industry has one of the ways of trying to deflect attention from extraction has been to emphasize consumption. You need to consume more. We'll carry on taking it out of the ground, of course, whereas really we need to be going back to the source. But nevertheless, there is a, a responsibility for all of us to do something. What are the things we can do? Well, I thought really of five different areas. There is campaigning and activism. There is contributing our skills and knowledge. If we have anything relevant to contribute or useful, then contributing that, whatever it might be. There's living more lightly on the earth, being vegetarian, vegan, Reducing energy use, making it more efficient. Green energy, various forms of uh, efficiency, insulation and so forth. Thinking about how we travel. Thinking about how we organise events so that there's less costs involved in travel. People coming to uh, a remote place, sharing a car, that kind of thing. 
There's helping others with our time and resources and asking for help from other people as well when we're working on things. We may not have much, to, much experience or knowledge or relevant information about um, aspects of climate change, but maybe we know somebody who does, and so maybe we can find some way of supporting them, just even encouraging them. I take a great deal of enjoyment out of encouraging my friend on geothermal, and, and uh, we have a lot of discussion about it. There's also the question of looking after ourselves, personal practice and, and our own care. It's very easy when thinking of this to feel overwhelmed, feel overly pessimistic, to have a sense of giving up. Well, those are practice issues. There's, uh, there's uh, no sense in trying to suppress those feelings, but also not allowing those feelings to run our lives, to run ourselves. Another of Master Sheng Yen's teachings was how to manage a problem, how to confront a problem. Two central points. The first of all is compassion. To have compassion for oneself and compassion for the others who are involved in this issue, whatever they're doing, whichever side of whatever fences we see. And the second is wisdom. Wisdom, of course, is being clear about what's going on, not being easily fooled, not being taken in, but also reflecting carefully on what is the most appropriate response, understanding our own energy, understanding what we can contribute and what we can't. And then he broke it down into four ways of tackling a problem. The first is to face it. And this talk, of course, is uh, an attempt, if you like, to express facing it. It is a very tricky problem, and it's extremely dangerous, and uh, the outcome is not certain. And we as a species are taking huge risks, and uh, that's facing it. And that then may lead to some sort of inner, if you like. There's then a need to face inwardly, and that might be facing a sense of despair, facing sadness or grief. If uh, at some point one is talking about this and starts to feel te tearful, then, then not to shun that or shut it off. To experience and face one's anger or rage or whatever it is. That's, these are all aspects of fake, facing it. And these are like a part of the, um, uh, of the Buddhist path. And you might say that there's a phrase uh, in Ikodama which is the ikosattva. A bodhisattva is a person who uh, commits themselves really to helping the world, to helping other people to taking care of people, to taking care of themselves, in, in the context of wisdom and compassion. And so you can see how ecosatva is the same sort of thing, basically. And I remember once Master uh, Shang Yen talking about bodhisattva said, if you decide to take on the path of a bodhisattva, you will suffer. <laughs> so ecosatva is being willing to acknowledge and face the suffering, the pain, the difficulty. And how do we avoid the facing it? Of course, then it's simply to denial, uh, not to want to talk about it. For some people, it's so frightening. They don't want to know, thank you very much, I'm not going to pay any attention to it. That's one way of not facing it. That's step one, face it. The second step is to accept it. Accept the problem is there, accept the reality of it. And of course, accepting it is the same as taking responsibility. And then, of course, the outer aspect of that is wisdom, expressing it, uh, uh, finding some way of um, understanding clearly what is going on, accepting it, taking responsibility, and it comes, the cost of uh, accepting it is commitment, making a commitment oneself, whatever that might be. Saying, OK, I'm committing to this every day because it's in the background, it's in my life all the time. I may not be a doing anything very big today, but I'm committing to it in some way. And how can you avoid that? Well, it's to live for yourself. Quite a lot of people say, yeah, no, I, yeah, of course, yeah, there is climate change. I absolutely fully, fully understand it. And I can see a lot of people are suffering. It's very difficult. It's not too bad here, though, is it? And I'm getting on anyway. And um, so it doesn't really matter too much. I'll enjoy my life while I can. And, uh, you know, hope for the best for you lot. <laughs> uh, that, if you like, is a way of avoiding it. Now, that's put rather crudely, but it's a very common response in a more subtle, uh, slightly less crude form. And then the third phase is to deal with it. Now, of course, we can't deal with this in that same sense as a complex very, very broad problem. But we, so when we're saying deal with it, we mean whatever we are going to do, whatever aspect we're going to take on, we identify it clearly that we're going to deal with that. And uh, the inner aspect of that then is to have some sort of resilience, a willingness to uh, follow through the implications of dealing with it. And to uh, the other aspect is to rely upon one's practice, one's own insight, and to take care of oneself. And the cost of that is time resources. For some people, it means they've decided that they will take the risk of going to prison. So there are various uh, costs associated. And how can we avoid it? Well, it's to, uh, to get caught up in feelings of guilt. I didn't do well enough. I'm not doing enough. I did not doing you know, all I should do. I could do more. That is not dealing with it. That's, uh, that's getting lost, if you like, in some sort of lonely space. 
So that's where practice comes in again, and compassion, compassion for oneself. The final phase, then, is to let it go. Whatever it is, you let it go. In other words, you do what you can. You can't control the outcome. You put your effort in, you make whatever you do. As long as you've done your best, you're not going to get yourself into a state if it doesn't work out the way that uh, you wanted it to. So you let it go in that sense. Letting it go might mean, of course, if something is successful, there's some sort of celebration, even if it's just simply saying, that went really well, I'm really glad about that, or sharing it with people in some way. It might be some sort of inner experience of you know, confidence and joy. If we succeed at one thing, it increases confidence. And then the benefit of that, of course, is a sense of renewal, refreshed. If we let it go, then we're fresh for the next time. You know, maybe we've worked really hard and need a rest now. So there's a kind of sense of uh, renewal and, pre- uh, and, and uh, freshness. But the, but the way of avoiding uh, letting it go leads to stress. And quite a lot of activists, of course, get into this problem of burning out because of overdoing, not understanding their own capacities and not uh, working out for themselves. The Ecosatva approach um, has been expressed in a series of vows. Based on my love of the world and understanding of deep interdependence of all things, I vow to live on earth more lightly and less violently in the food, products and energy I consume. To commit myself daily to the healing of the world and the welfare of all beings. To discern and replace human systems of oppression and harm. To invite personal discomfort as an opportunity to share in the challenge of our collective liberation. To draw inspiration, strength and guidance from the living earth, ancestors and the future generations, as well as siblings of all species. To help others in their work for the world and to ask for help when I feel the need. To pursue a daily spiritual practice that clarifies my mind, strengthens my heart and supports me in observing these vows. John Crook used to talk about vow power. That uh, by taking a vow, it becomes then a guiding uh, direction for one's life. Of course... These uh, externally written vows by somebody else will not necessarily be appropriate or the, the guiding principles for each of our individual lives. But if we connect with our place in nature, if we connect with our natural self, then we are, if you like, um, making a direct connection to the vow of life itself, the vow of living. We had this beautiful exercise yesterday um, when we were doing the, the movements, the five uh, elements a practice that Stuart did. And he described it as a practice of connecting back to the earth, connecting back to your life. So if you can find your own true vow in this, then you will be truly useful. Thank you.